I have to do this disclosure. The, uh, for the life of me, I don't know if I'm still on this advisory board. They list me on the website, and what these people do is they work with pharmacy chains to come up with um, educational pamphlets and things like that to promote adherence. So they had me come to Boston one time, and they gave me $1,000 and a really nice jacket. So that's my disclosure. <laughs> they, since then, they haven't given me a cent or no more jackets, so I don't know what the deal is. So uh, how many people have heard this book by Dr. Uh, Groupman? We have one doctor in the audience, I know for sure, a psychiatrist. But the, the interesting thing about how doctors think, it's a really good book about, and, and as psychologists, we know about cognitive errors that people make, uh, like the anchoring bias, things like that. Well, Dr. Kuhlman talks about that, and I think he's an emergency room doc. He talks about that in terms of how doctors make those kind of cognitive errors. But I borrowed one of his sentences. Physicians like to succeed in their treatment, and the essential ingredient for that success is the patient's cooperation. So when I started out in pediatric psychology training in 1977, um, I thought to myself, what could I do research on that would benefit my medical colleagues in pediatrics? And I thought, well, there wasn't much in the way of research on adherence. It was mainly on diabetes. It was mainly on adults. It was mainly on hypertension in adults. And I thought, well, what's an area that I can get involved in? And I sort of stumbled on arthritis in children, which is the third most common chronic condition. And I happen to have an excellent uh, collaborator in Carol Lindsley, who's a very well-known pediatric dermatologist, award-winning rheumatologist, and she and I have been doing this work together for a long time. So I got my little niche in rheumatology, and now I'm kind of known as the, the, the uh, um, token pediatric psychologist in all these meetings in uh, pediatric dermatology. But we started publishing that area, and I thought, if I can help my colleagues be successful in what they're doing, and they can have effective treatments that are empirically validated, but if the patients don't follow them, they don't have very good outcomes, right? So one route to that of improving outcomes is to make sure that people do follow medical advice. So here are the learning objectives. Uh, it looks like a lot, folks, but I'm going to go through fairly fast on some of the slides. So what I'd like to do is define for you adherence, the types of non-adherence that we see, methods for assessing uh, the incidents and consequences of non-adherence. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about measures of barriers. That's kind of been an, uh, a new area for us. Uh, I want to describe adherence enhancement strategies, and there have been two meta-analyses that have been done to look at the efficacy of different uh, interventions to improve adherence to pediatric medical regimens. One was done by our group at Kansas, and the other by Denny Droder and his group at Cincinnati. So here are two definitions side by side. As you can see, the one on the left is the one that's been used the most. The extent to which a person's behavior in terms of taking medicines, following diets, or executing lifestyle changes coincides with medical or health advice. Now look at this other one, uh, except for the weird English spelling of behavior. Don't you always see that in there? Is that you in there? there. I don't know. What's, the English don't know how to spell behavior. I mean, anyway, our people other than Americans, maybe we ought to spell behavior that way. Huh? Maybe we're off. But as you can see, that first part of the definition is the same, except for this little part down here. Corresponds with agreed upon recommendations, or agreed a recommendation, from a health care provider. That's the difference in the WHO definition. I think it's an important one, because what it says should at least in the beginning, a provider should at least in the beginning, have some sort of commitment to patients and families that they're going to try the regimen that has been prescribed. Okay. And you don't get that definition over here in the Haynes at all. So I really like this one. And this is the one I kind of I kind of use both together because a lot of people know the one on the left. Uh, but I like this one here because it really talks about negotiating with families ahead of time about whether they're willing to do something. And we'll talk more about that later. So what are the types of medication non-adherence? Uh, some people don't fill the prescription. How many of you have not filled the prescription? I've got my hand up. Okay, all right. You made a decision. You didn't need it, right? Uh, I'm not going to ask you why. Not or delaying in refilling prescriptions. The most common type of non-adherence pattern is omitting doses. 
some people take what are called drug holidays, no doses for several concurrent days, and then they resume it. Problem with that is, if you're at the full dose of the medication, particularly cardiac drugs, you take a vacation for a few days, and then you go back on the regular dose that you were on, you can have some real toxicity problems, okay? Because a lot of it's washed out of your system in a few days, and then you get this very high level that you're putting back on. So you have to be very careful about drug holidays. Oops, sorry. You all know about, you know about white coat hypertension? Everybody know about that? So your blood pressure goes up when you go see the doctor. Mine does every time. You guys, your blood pressure go up when you go see the doctor? The hands are sweaty. You don't know what they're going to tell you, all that. And then my, my doctor is so smart, I've had him for a long time, and he, he always takes two blood pressures. He ignores the one his nurse does, and then he does his own. Once we got to talking, he, and, he, and I'm more comfortable. So that's white coat adherence, and what that says, in, and the toothbrush effect says, that when people are going to the doctor, right around the time they go, and right after they go, their adherence goes up. Now the toothbrush effect refers to what? So I'm going to the dentist next Tuesday when I get back. Guess what I'm going to be doing Sunday, Monday? Flossing a lot, brushing a lot, using that whitening toothpaste I'm supposed to use, particularly in certain areas, you know. So that's what we do. We kind of up our effort right before we go in. And that's true of adherence. And then there are people who overdose. If a little is good, more is better. We've had that happen in studies, even to the point where the patient could potentially be in danger. And then people think, well, I'll just take up a makeup dose. You know, I didn't take one yesterday, my antihypertensive, so I'm going to take two tomorrow. Well, that may be a problem if that's too high of a dose. Right. So first, before we talk about the extent of the problem of adherence, I want to talk to you a bit about how you measure adherence. And these are the ones I'm going to kind of go through fast. Um, they are listed from most to least objective, basically, although I'll put some caveats in there as we go along. So you've got drug assays, you've got observations of people, automated measures or electronic measures I'll talk about. Pill counts have been around a long time treatment outcome, provider estimates, and patient reports. So, assays, what's the advantage? Well, if you can get a drug level, you can adjust drug levels, so doctors kind of like those. And occasionally, you can get these in urine and even saliva. So with children, who I work with, that's a real advantage, because you don't want to do blood sticks if you don't have to, right? They're very objective and quantifiable, but the pharmacokinetics are really tricky with pediatric patients. And the younger the kids are, the more trickier it gets. So uh, they have very different absorption and excretion rates. It's short-term and invasive. So if you did an assay on a Monday, how far back would that tell you about that person's adherence? And I'm going to just kind of vote. One day before? Two days before? You understand the question? Depends on the half-life, exactly right. Third, uh, thir three days before? On average, I'm asking on average. How many think three? It is three. So the on average, but this, this young lady was very correct, that it depends on the half-life. But so what you're looking at is adherence over a relatively short time, maybe five days before. So what could happen? Well, maybe the people knew they were coming to the doctor, the white coat adherence effect. They start up and they're, you know, they're really good about taking their pills and all that stuff. The opposite could happen. Maybe you have a patient that's really been very, very good, and for the last two or three days, something happened. They were on vacation. They were staying all night at somebody's house. They forgot their medicine, whatever, and it's not a very good indication of how adherent they are. Uh, observation measures are almost impossible to get. When are you going to observe people? Well, most of the time you're having parents observe their kids, in the case of our study. And we've gotten good reliability with parents, and you can measure it on uh, repeated occasions, which is nice. They're obtrusive, so that when you're watching, they behave differently. Now, it turns, on that, it turns out that reactive effect is true about a lot of measurements, but it usually goes away after a couple of weeks, okay? And it's very difficult to obtain representative samples with observations. Automated measures is a big thing now. So we have electronic measures that give you the precise dosing and dosing interval data, 
They are continuous and long-term. Uh, most of them do not measure consumption. That's the big problem. In the beginning, there were a lot of mechanical failures. That tends to be better now. And let me show you a couple examples. This is the medication event monitoring system. How many people have heard of this? Okay, you know about this. Okay, so essentially, you put the pills in there, and when the patient opens the container, it records the exact time and day they opened it, right? And so it records uh, date and time cap removed. It has about an 18-month battery life. It stores about 3,800 events. It, it's got software uh, that you can download the data, which you must pay for. And then the cost, and this is the concern a lot about electronic measures, is about 185 per device. That's the website currently for Ardex, the company that does MEMS. We are currently using the MEMS to look at adhesive and other drugs in the treatment of JA with uh, kids. Okay, so the MEMS, I was going to tell you, there, there's what the printouts look like. They the exact time and day that the cap was opened. And that's actually an older printout, so they're a little fancier looking now. There's the smart track, and they're available for a variety of devices you can see listed on the bottom there. Um, they record inhaler installed and removed, which is important to know when people switch their inhalers out, right? And then they, uh, they register canister act actuation and, the date, and their date and time stamped. Um, Two to three months between charges, they're reusable, which is nice. The MEMS supposedly is not reusable, according to the company. But uh, the FDA has approved for the smart inhalers to be reused if they are sterilized, and they have on their website how you sterilize them. So that's a real advantage. Um, I wish we could do that with the MEMS, because it would really save us some money. They do have devices now for disc and turbo inhalers, which they're kind of starting to go to. And the cost is about $195. Software available to download. Nexus is the company. Pill counts are what they look like, or what they sound like. So you take 20 pills there, and 20 pills a week later, and 10 are missing. What's the percent they should have been missing? You know, they're supposed to be taking so many a day. And then you, and you could do the same thing with canister weights. Uh, problem is you overestimate here. It's, again, it's the thing people like, dump their pills, right? Give them to the dog. You know, we've had a lot of dogs with very high non anti-inflammatory levels. And somebody gave it to a dog or a family member. Hey, you want a naproxen? You know, you give me an naproxen to somebody. Um, my daughter, who doesn't like flying anymore, told me she had Xanax the other day. I said, where, where did you get Xanax? She said, it's one of her friends, of course. So you don't know if they take it, you know? It's better than patient or physician estimates, uh, treatment outcomes are not measures of adherence. So forget that. Doctors use those as proxy measures of adherence. If they see a kid with asthma, severe asthma, who's been on a proper regimen, they bring them back, their pulmonary function uh, values look crappy still, they're going to conclude this kid is not following the regimen, which may not be true. Blood pressure is the same way. People look at blood pressure and say, if the blood pressure is up, after being on an antihypertensive regimen, they're not following the regimen. It's not necessarily true. They may be in on an inadequate dose, may have a lot of stress in their life, all kinds of things. So we need to measure treatment outcome, particularly in studies, to determine the relationship between adherence and outcome, but not use it as a proxy measure of adherence. And I'm including in that hemoglobin A1C. A lot of people think that's an adherence measure. It is not. It's a control measure how much control you have your diabetes roughly over a three-month period. So physician estimates are clinically feasible and crappy. No other way to say it. Doesn't matter how experienced you are. I ask my graduate students when we objectively measure adherence in a study to estimate with each family how adherent you think they're going to be. And I've done it with my physician colleagues. They're all 50-50. It's like flipping a coin. They don't know what they're talking about. And neither do I. My, my judgment is not any better than theirs, because what are we basing it on? If you ask a pediatrician, and I've asked pediatricians, I have a clinic on Tuesdays where I practice with about seven pediatricians in their office as part of my outreach clinic from the university. So I asked them one day, when I was writing my, my first edition of my adherence book, how do you know your patient's taking their medicine or not? 
Well, they judged it based on symptoms. So if they took pulmonary function, function testing and the kid wasn't doing well, they thought the kid wasn't positive. They based it on the education level of the parents or the SES level of the parents. Um, how forthcoming the parents were about admitting that they missed some doses. If they said, I never miss them, and the kid's not doing well, they didn't believe them. So they were looking at factors like that and making their decisions. So it's no wonder that they, they're not very accurate. Patient report has been given a bad rap. Um, it does overestimate adherence. If you ask parents and kids, they tend to report that they do more than they really do. Right? And then we call that in psychology faking good, you know, presentational bias. We want them to like us, our doctors. We want to. Now, sometimes it's don't ask, don't tell. The doctor doesn't ask, and the patient doesn't tell. So the classic example is that Mike Rapoff gets a compression fracture about 15 years ago, trying to, trying to be young, playing softball with a bunch of clinical psych students. Had no business playing, by the way. Got knocked over, bam, compression fracture. Next day, I was supposed to go to Minnesota for a week-long trip of fishing that I do with guys, used to do with a bunch of guys. Go into the doctor's office, x-ray my compression fracture. Here's what you need to do. Lay down, stay at home, take these painkillers, blah, blah, blah. My wife was with me because she goes with me to appointments when she thinks I'm not going to tell the truth or be forthcoming, right? So she's sitting there, and she says to Larry, my longtime doctor. He thinks he's going fishing tomorrow for a week. He's going to drive to Minnesota. He's going to ride in a car in with Minnesota and then be in a boat fishing with a bunch of guys. So Larry says, Mike, there's no way. You can't do that. Okay. We walked out of the doctor's office and my wife says, you're going fishing tomorrow, aren't you? And I said, yeah. I had no intention of following his advice. But it was don't ask, don't tell. He didn't say, now, Mike, are you going to follow my advice? He just said, I think this is what you ought to do. And I said, uh-huh. <laughs> OK? <laughs> That's the way that went. And I think it goes that way a lot, you know? I don't, I don't have data on that, but I think it does happen. So, but here's the thing. I think we can improve on self-reported adherence. And from a clinical standpoint, I want to tell you this. You're going to rely on self-report. Unless you're doing a research study and you have money to get electronic monitors and the rest, you're going to ask patients and you're going to ask parents. It behooves us to develop reliable and valid measures of self-report of adherence. Now, we're getting there. There's some pretty good ones. If you go to the Division 54 website, you will see some um, evidence-based um, handouts. And it's in the top right corner of the Division 54 website. And you can click on. Um, evidence-based adherence assessments, or evidence-based assessments. And one of the categories is on adherence. And you'll see some instruments there that look very promising, some that have been around for a long time, but they're self-report or patient report. So we're getting there. We're starting to develop it because we're realizing that to develop these measures, we have to evaluate adherence in an in information-intensive approach. What medicines are you taking? What dose? How often have you had any side effects? And then you probe for non-adherence in a non-judgmental and non-threatening manner. Not, did you take all your medicine I asked you to take? You don't say, yeah. So you say things like, many people have trouble remembering to take their medicine. What does that say? It says it's normative. And in fact, 50% of people with chronic illnesses don't take their medicine regularly. That's pretty common, right? So you tell people that. Do you ever forget to take yours? Do you ever stop taking it on purpose? And then the time frame for questioning about adherence should be limited to the previous seven to 10 days. Where did we get that? <coughs> we got that from our cognitive psychologist colleagues who tell us that unless it's a very, very salient event, most of us don't remember back 10 days. And people like me in two days who are going to be 61 don't remember more than about two or three days. And my wife would tell me, tell you that I don't remember a minute ago when she told me something, right? So, so that's usually the limit. So I always say to medical students, here's a hypothetical question. Please don't answer it. Please don't answer it. But if I said to you, 
And a lot of adherence questionnaires say this. In the past three months, that's what they say, in the past three months, how many bowel movements did you have? Really? In the past three months? OK, 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 that's hard. How about in the past month, how many bowel movements did you have? Month? Let's see, October 5th? Uh, I'm not sure. OK, past two weeks, how many bowel movements have you had? Yeah, you get a little closer. Particularly if I said in the past week. So today is Friday, and you say, let's see, Sunday I pooped. <laughs> I remember I pooped. I remember it was right before football started. Then um, football game started. And then t Monday I, I was at work. You know, I pooped at work. Yeah, I pooped at work. I don't like to poop at work, but I pooped at work. Tuesday I didn't poop. No, I didn't poop. It's so on and so on. It, we'll get a pretty good idea objectively monitor whether you pooped or not, when you had your spouse or significant other reporting on it, that you'd be pretty accurate, right? OK. So that's the poop example. And that, you just use those in pediatrics. We talk about poop all the time in pediatrics. The other thing is to ask parents and, fam and, and children about barriers to adherence. And I'll talk a little bit about barriers to adherence. So in um, research studies, it is recommended that you use automated measures plus some kind of assay if you can. Because your automated will give you more long-term measurement over time, repeated measures. Your assay periodically gives you the idea of whether they've actually taken the medicine or not. Trying to combine it, particularly if you can get uh, saliva or urine assay so you're not having to draw blood on children and even teenagers who don't like that or adults who don't like that. That would be preferable. But that's really for research. Now, these are busy, busy slides. I want to point out to you that these are really just to tell you what the ranges of adherence looks like. And as you can see, this, this is just on adherence to inhaled steroids, which I'm kind of interested in. This is our study here. What I want you to pay attention to is the consistency when you look at electronic monitoring. So it's about 50% adherence. Our study found a little higher rate of 69, but if you look at, and here's the thing to think about too, folks. When somebody reports adherence was 69%, that means one of two things. It means they ca calculated the average across the sample, and it was 69, or they had some kind of classification system, like here. See the difference here? 65% were classified as non-adherent, which was defined as less than 80% of their inhaled steroids taken as recorded by electronic monitoring. So when you see these studies, make sure that you're looking at whether we're looking at overall mean or they're reporting the percent of people that were non-adherent or adherent by some criterion. Now, where did that 80% come from? That's the other thing you have to ask. Well, that 80% from, came from early studies in Canada with adults with hypertension. And they found that if adults with hypertension took 80% or more of their antihypertensives, they had systematic de decreases in blood pressure. Turns out that's true also for children. But everybody from then on said 80% is the criterion. If you take 80% or more, you're adherent. Well, and they even quoted me one time. I saw some study in the literature that quoted RAP office, the one that invented this standard. I sent a letter to the author and said, hey, I'm not the one that did this, by the way. Um, it turns out that's not true. With HIV, antiretroviral drugs, what would you guess the average adherence rate needs to be to get systematic decreases in viral load? It's not 80%. It's higher than that. Most people agree 95%. You've got to be pretty closely adherent to those regimens. Now, if you look at prednisone and the treatment of cancer, the one thing I want to say about that, look at these dates, 92, 83, 79. This was done at Kansas, this study. And they were doing serum and urine assays and finding these levels of adherence. And also that people's adherence um, in this study actually got a little better over time. That's usually not the case. Uh, the one thing I want to say about this is there's no recent study. So somebody a number of years ago asked me to do a chapter on adherence to cancer regimens in pediatrics. I didn't find anything. 
So if you're interested in doing something in the area of adherence where not many people were doing anything, I suggest that you get into cancer. This is a new one, gluten-free diet for celiac disease. And a lot of they, they're doing a lot of goofy things like having the gastroenterologist classifying them and they're doing this dietitian interview or serum antibodies or nitric oxide level. I mean, these, I don't know what to make of these. They're all over the place and they're being measured by different methodologies. So if you, if you wanted to come up with some average figure for gluten-free diets and adherence, you'd be hard pressed, I would think. Now, antiretroviral meds, um, they tend to ask about reported misses missing in the past week, sometimes in the past month. And as you can see, they, um, if I lost my thing here. As you can see, 44% of caregiver use reported missing doses past week, a mean of 80.9% first uh, three months, and then drops a little during the last three months. That was by electronic monitoring. I like to see that. Again, 40% of caregivers, 50% uh, patients reported missing in the past month, 43 past week, um, and that's kind of the way they usually ask about those things, the past three days, the past week, past month. So still, there's some degree of non-adherence. We've done most of the studies in this area of adherence to non anti-inflammatory. Um, the Feldman group did this particular study by parent report, and they actually found that adherence did not drop, but again, that was by family report. These were by pill counts in a drug study which showed a very low rate of non-adherence that I think is not very representative. Uh, and neither was this one with the pill counts, 95%. Uh, These two studies looked at serum assays by Litt and colleagues and they found consistently 45%. Uh, the Rapoff et al. study, we showed median levels, showed partial or no adherence on 21% of the days. 48% of patients were non-adherent based on this, less than 80% of doses, and we used electronic monitoring. So there have been a few in that area. Post-transplantation is very interesting because if people are not taking their immunosuppressive drugs post-transplantation, it, it's a very sad outcome, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. As you can see, there's some pretty high non-adherence rates. Um, this one was a little, the, the adherence rate was very good in this study, about 80%. But in some of these studies, even half the patients you know, using very objective methods uh, to corroborate patient report shows around that 50% non-adherence rate. So, yeah, so anyway, there's, that's, that's a pretty significant problem. So what are the consequences of non-adherence? And this is the serious part. If physicians are unaware of non-adherence, they may order more invasive, risky, and costly procedures and may prescribe more potent meds with greater side effects. So doctors usually believe that adherence is a problem in medicine. If you tell them that consistently in the pediatric and adult literature, 50% of people with chronic illnesses don't follow their treatment as they should. And most doctors will say, yeah, I believe that's true. But it's not true of my patient, right? True of everybody else's patient, not mine. And so they really underestimate this as a problem. And if they do, and, and the regimen doesn't work, they're going to say, oh, I've got to up this, I've got to do more, I've got, you know, which can add to a lot more problems for the patient in terms of side effects and all kinds of things. We've worked out in asthma pretty well what happens with non adherence. Kids end up in the ER, they get hospitalized. Uh, we uh, fortunately have had a leveling off of, of asthma-related deaths. Uh, school absences and functional limitations continue in ER visits. How many people are familiar with kids ending up in the ER with asthma? Should almost never happen if they're properly treated, okay? And the other thing to talk about with these uh, increases in ER, or these ER visits and hospitalizations, it's much more common in African-American children. The thing I want to say about that is I think that one relates to access to health care, where they go through the ER for the treatment. The second is there's some studies to show that those children are not treated adequately. In other words, if they have moderate to severe asthma, children, African American children in this country are less likely than Caucasian children to get an inhaled steroid. And Hispanic children are about in the middle of that. Okay? 
So part of that could be that we're not really treating that population very well. This is sad. In this one particular study, 71% of non-adherence uh, patients experienced a rejection of their transplant or partial loss. Now, when you look at something like the kidneys, okay, we can say, okay, if he lo loses the kidney, you can still say, well, there's somebody else that wanted one that didn't get it who potentially could die from kidney disease. But in general, they can go back on you know, their, their treatment and uh, dialysis, and they can do okay. But if you're talking about heart lung or heart transplant, and you get a kid that gets what the heart or heart lung, is non-adherent, loses the graft, loses the, the organ, and you got all these kids on the waiting list dying, waiting for it. The same in the adult area, by the way. So it's a dual tragedy, and the kids that had it and were not following their treatment lost it. That one particularly touches me, and there's really, uh, there's very, very good evidence that non-adherence is, uh, is associated with higher viral loads in HIV and AIDS. And then the cost of non-adherence in the U.S., this is kind of an old study, but that figure seems to hold about $100 billion. So let me switch gears and talk a little bit about barriers to adherence, the real interest of mine. Um, in our particular, in my way, I particularly I define it this way, the person's perception of impediments to adhere to treatments, including a cost-benefit analysis where the person weighs the pros and cons of taking action. It's the most predictive variable from the health belief model, which has been around since the 50s. And the nice thing is you can match unique barriers identified by patients and families to specific protocols to address those barriers. So in my lab, Michelle Tai, um, uh, Kurt Matson, Rapoff and Lindsley is our pediatric rheumatologist, but Michelle is the one who's taken the lead on this in our lab has developed a barriers measure for children with juvenile arthritis. Now, the one we started out with was the one for the parents. We're also working on one for the kids. So we define for the parents obstacles or things that get in the way of you helping your child be consistent in following medical treatment for arthritis. Please check yes for each barrier experienced in the past week or no if it didn't. Very simple. So here are the sample items um, I just forgot when to give my child medications. It's too hard when we're not at home. Pills are too hard to swallow. My child refuses. I'm not sure the child needs medicine. I did not fill or refill because I could not afford them. That's happening more and more often. And if you look at barriers and Michelle, the other thing Michelle's working on with Avni Modi and myself, Avni is at Cincinnati Children's Hospital, expert on adherence and barriers to adherence. We're looking at barriers that across a number of chronic illnesses. And these were the top five in the study so far that uh, Michelle has been reviewing. Patient or parent forgets, patient dislikes medication, oppositional behavior, treatment interferes with daily activities, and difficulty incorporating treatment regimens into daily life. So you consistently see this business of forgetting, right? So if you keep seeing something, there's something there. And then we've got to design interventions to address that issue of people forgetting. How can we remind them? What systems could we be in place? Can you set your alarms, rings at a certain time? Can there be programs on your phone app that would remind you when to take medicine? Well, there are such things, by the way. You know, how can we deal with that? Some people are surprised a little bit about oppositional behavior, but I can tell you <laughs> it happens a lot more than you think, and we'll talk We'll talk a little bit more about that. So here are the barriers identified by the young people. Again, top one is forgetting. The other thing is it interferes with their life, which overlap, uh, overlaps with their parents. Interestingly enough, the kids talked about psychosocial difficulties. I'm, ha you know, I'm anxious, depressed. I'm tired of dealing with my illness. I'm having difficulty coping. Uh, and also communication or disagreements with their health care provider or the regimen being just too complex. So those barriers can then be used to enhance adherence, OK? And we'll talk more about that. So generally, when you look at, and let's get in now to enhancement. What do you do about the problem? How do we help people be more consistent? And generally, people put these in three categories. Educational, about the disease, the treatments, the importance of adherence. 
organizational strategies or delivering healthcare in a way that facilitates adherence and behavioral, cognitive and, and behavior change strategies to enhance adherence. So what do you do with education? Well, you tell people about their disease in a way they can understand. What's the cause? What's the course? What's the prognosis? What are the treatments? What do you need to do and why do you need to do it? Uh, the negative side effects and how to minimize those. And a lot of times doctors don't like to talk about that because they said, well, if I talk about that, then they're going to have it. Come on. If you've got a non steroidal anti inflammatory you're taking on a regular basis, you're going to get a stomach ache at some time. That happens. You've got to tell people about that. What do you do to prevent that? Take it with food, take it with milk. And the other component that is not emphasized in most educational programs for children with chronic illnesses is the importance of adherence. You'll see all kinds of programs developed by the Starve Right Foundation, other people that have educational elements to it, but no one talks about adherence. And that's what we're doing in our stuff that I'm going to tell you about. So education's ongoing. That's the other thing that doctors don't understand. So a patient will come in and they'll consult us about some problem and they'll say, well, I already told them that. Okay. If it's the first visit and you told them, what happens when people at the first visit are told their child has a chronic illness? What emotions are they experiencing? Anxiety. What does that anxiety do with your memory? Right? It interferes just a little bit, doesn't it? You know, when you go in and take your tests, how that happens. And then effective verbal communication, avoiding the jargon, stressing instructions, repeating information, encouraging questions. The written and other media will talk more about, particularly with like electronic uh, methods. And modeling and rehearsing, this is very simple. Let's say, I've seen this happen a million times. So a kid with asthma gets a meter dose inhaler to use, and the doctor says, or usually it's not the doctor, it's the nurse. The nurse says, okay, this is a meter dose inhaler. This is what it's used for, and here's how you do it. Put it about this far from your mouth, and push, and then and hold that for 10 seconds. <laughs> and then they say, or they're showing this to the parent too, then they say, does that, you got that? You make sense? You know, you know what that question is? Are you stupid? You know, if you say it to a parent, uh, model it, and you say, did you get that, mom? What's the mom going to say? Oh, yeah, I got it. I mean, you're not going to, you know, no, I'm a moron. I just missed everything you told me, right? So we have to have them rehearse the thing that, particularly more complex things, like trying to use a meter dose inhaler, because it's, up to about 30, 40% of health professionals don't even know how to use a meter dose inhaler, okay? So we've got to make sure that the families know how to do it. So you you say, okay, mom, you try it, or you try it, child, and, and then correct any mistakes and say, okay, good, you got it. Now, you don't know if they're going to do it consistently. What you do know is they know how to do it, right? They're skilled at doing it. They're, they know what's going on. Okay. So organizational increase access to health care. There's good evidence to support that the more follow-up, uh, particularly children with uh, more severe chronic illnesses, see a subspecialist, the better they do. Consumer-friendly clinical settings. Do you guys have those at your hospital? Yeah. We've got a long way to go on that one, don't we? Long. You know what the number one complaint of our patients were the other day? Families, we got a survey back in pediatrics. What can you guess? in our outpatient clinic. What's the number one problem? Parking. What is it? Parking. Parking, yes, number one part. Well, it's actually not number one, it's about number two. Wait time. I wait to get checked in. I get in the, the, the room, and I'm in a room for another 15, 20 minutes, and my child's screaming, they have an ear infection, and there are no toys in the room. Okay, that's the kind of stuff you hear. So, um, so we need consumer-friendly clinical settings, particularly for children. Get them in and out of there fast. Have a very um, child-friendly environment. Have parents bring toys for their kids, that kind of stuff. Increase provider supervision. If you just ask about adherence issues, doctors don't ask about it. You look at the charts of doctors, they don't ask about adherence. Like, like I, I said, said, it's don't ask, don't tell, right? Simplify the regimen. Is there a way to make this easier for the person to adapt it to their lifestyle and their schedule, which has been going on a lot longer than your prescribed schedule. Fit it in to their life. Their life isn't just us. 
and what we do and what we recommend. We think sometimes in psychology that 45 minutes an hour we spend with patients a week is the most important element in their life. Well, get a, get a life, folks. It's not true, right? They got a lot more things going on than us. So, and then minimize negative side effects, and I mentioned that before. Behavioral strategies, we recommend a lot of parental endowment. I think that's key, and I think it's key even with teenagers. The reason I think adherence in part drops off in adolescence is because parents abruptly discontinue their involvement. And that needs to be done in a way that's developmentally appropriate, in a way that matches how this adolescent can handle their regimen. Okay. But I still think parents need to be involved. And I'll tell you, in talking to the teenagers, they still appreciate the fact their parents are involved. And then prompting adherence, and I mentioned that. There are phone apps. There are things that you can use to remind people. We have calendars, all kinds of things like that. We use adherence incentives. With little kids, we use poker chips or points that they earn. And they can trade those for special or uh, regular kind of privileges. And those work very well, behavioral strategies. Discipline. One of the most difficult things is for parents of chronically ill children to discipline their children. It, it, there have been some studies showing that they're less likely to do it. And if you ask their siblings, they'll tell you that. He never goes to time out. He gets away with everything. He doesn't have to do anything around the house. And we kind of resent him. And then we do some contracting with uh, older people. Uh, teenagers, I really like to do this kind of stuff with them, self-management. Set goals. You know, what are your goals? Let's get this out of the realm of a conflict between you and your parents. Let's not care about that. Let's care about what you want. This is your illness. You have diabetes, not them. What are your goals? How do you, how do you want your life to be? How do you want to control the potential negative consequences of your disease? If you get it out of that, that this is the struggle between mom and dad, or mom and teenager, or dad and teenager, then you can get it to what, what do you want as a person? And sometimes nobody's ever asked a teenager that. And then, I, then there are more complex uh, interventions that, um, that parents, that we use with parents. And that would be more like family behavior therapy systems uh, interventions, like uh, Tim Wysocki at Nemours Clinic and other people like that have done really uh, very extensive interventions. And those are really for families that really have much more serious problems. Questions? A very good question. The question was about uh, medication adherence to ADHD type medicines. Um, that is not my area of expertise, but interestingly enough, one of my graduate students is pulling me into this. She's doing her dissertation on that very thing, and she's looking at two different things. She's looking at one, these are newly diagnosed kids within the last okay? And she's looking at which, fam which families and, and kids initiate therapy, right? And what are the predictors of that? Because some people don't ever fill the prescription. They don't put their kid on the meds. And once they do, though, what are the reasons why they might discontinue or why their adherence rates might be lower? So she is looking at that. And then the studies that I've read that she has written up for a proposal, there are very, there are not very many of them. I'm very, very surprised. I mean, she came up with maybe eight or ten or so that were even looking at it. The other thing that surprised me is there really, as far as she could see, there weren't any interventions specifically looking at adherence. Is that true, or, or are there some more? There aren't. Okay, good. Yeah, good, good. So you guys know more about that than I do, but I, I can tell you, I was very surprised when my student gave me that material that it wasn't researched more than it has been. But I think that's true of a lot of different psychotropic medications that we haven't really looked at that very well. But very good question. It's a good area. Now, let me uh, just tell you about some meta-analyses. And you all know about meta-analyses? OK, I won't educate you about them then. So you know this. The effect sizes are, are this is Cohen's thing, 10, small, 30 is medium, 50 is large. I do like to show people this kind of thing. Um, low dose aspirin and risk of heart attack, 0.02. Uh, Antihypertensive and decreased risk of stroke is 0.03. 
Calcium intake in bone mass in premenopausal women, effect size is 0.08. Ever smoking and subsequent incidence of lung cancer within 25 years, you might be very surprised about this effect size, 0.08. I like this one. Prominent movie critic reviews and box office success. 0.17, pretty good. Psychotherapy and well-being, we'd like to hear about this, wouldn't we? 0.32. What I want to say is that, look, we're doing pretty well relative to medicine, right? Of course, that first study, the low aspirin thing, when so many people were in that study, they stopped it, you know, they, because it was so helpful in, when you get those masses of people. And, Viva La, uh, Viagra, 0.38. So. so that just gives you a little bit of a comparison. First analysis uh, by my colleague, Denny Droger, and his folks, they looked at seven uh, studies, and as you can see, most of these were done. This is a meta-analysis of in interventions for adherence. Most were done with asthma and diabetes. Um, most were randomized controlled trials, which is really a nice thing, I think. Uh, Mean age was about 10.2. Breakdown of male, female is pretty good. This is disturbing. 82% Caucasian in our studies. Uh, only 15 re studies reported on SES, so you can't even aggregate those data. Uh, the intervention types were generally multi-component. A lot of people do components of educational and behavioral. That's not uncommon. Uh, I was a little surprised that uh, 52 almost 53% were group interventions. Um, now, the one point I want to make about this very busy slide here that's a bit discouraging is the outcome variable for adherence was either patient or parent report a combination of the two in 81% of the studies. So, you know, you'd like to see more blood assay, urine assays, electronic monitoring, so we're, we're kind of falling down there. But the results were the mean, and the mean uh, um, the weighted by sample size mean D effect size across all the inherent outcomes was in the small range. So it's, two, it's 0.34. However, there was significant heterogeneity across the adherence outcomes. Therefore, you had to examine potential mediators, or moderators, I'm sorry. So as you can see, when they looked at type of interventions, the most effective ones were in the medium range were the behavioral and multi-component. As you can see, education is real small with 0.16. You've got these in all your slides, too, don't you guys? Uh, type of adherence outcomes, self-management, self-care, exercise, yielded um, um, medium Ds, while medication adherence were smaller. Type of disorders are better with CF, less so with asthma. Pre and post experimental versus control, medium to large. So it depended on kind of the design. And then the D, or the effect size diminished over time in, in these studies. So the second one was done by uh, Monsart Graves, one of our former students at Kansas. She looked at a little different uh, grouping of studies, 71. She did not include obesity and lifestyle changes like smoking and like was done with the previous studies. So these are really just chronic illnesses. 48% uh, used a comparison group, 17 used a within subject pre-post. And the interesting thing on this review is we included single subject design studies which was not included in the previous one. Of the group designs, um, as you can see, there was over 3,000 patients. Um, again, asthma and diabetes were the more common studies, adherent studies. Single subject design studies were done with um, 20, there were 20 of those with 50 patients. Again, diabetes was the top one, although we had three with GIA and CF. Uh, two of these, I can tell you, was wrap off at all. We did those. Group designs, um, again, child and parent report, diary and electronic monitoring. I was a little more encouraged by the single subject designs that they use some diary methods uh, in electronic monitoring in the single subject. Group design ages, you can see the average was nine years, it was 11 years in the single subject. Um, uh, mean of a, yeah, pretty good ratio of males to females. Uh, it, it, on these group designs, we, there were a little more minor, minority students here, minority patients, and uh, also with the single subject designs, we had actually two studies that were with minority patients only. So, 
And so uh, the group designs in this uh, combine educational and behavioral and, and these breakdowns here. Uh, Segal subject, they used a lot of educational behavioral. And the mean weighted effect size um, for group designs was 0.58, which is medium range. The moderators in that study were higher effect sizes for studies using a weightless control versus an alternative treatment design. And let me just tell you, when you're developing the intervention, you first want to see, does it work relative to doing nothing different or usual care? And that's really what a weightless design is for you. But when you use an alternative design, it's a much more stringent test. So that's why you're going to see that the effect sizes are much higher for a weightless control design than for an alternative treatment design. So the mean effect size for single subject designs was very large, 1.53, and, and it was homoge homogeneous. Now, why would there be better or higher effect sizes for single subject design? How many know about single subject designs in here? Or has ever dealt with them? Okay. Well, the deal is with those, you've got repeated measures, you're graphing the data, and you essentially have to convince your colleagues that an effect occurred relative to baseline or some other condition. And so I think that it takes a lot more to convince people using single subject designs that effects have occurred, and therefore more successful interventions are published. That's just my theory. I don't know if it's true or not. The second one uh, study that we did, uh, they reported on health outcomes. And the nice thing here is that we had a uh, small to medium effect size on the health outcomes. And they were best for A1C, pulmonary function testing, disease activity, and healthcare utilization. So research implications for meta-analysis, let's rely less on indirect measures. Uh, we need more larger randomized control trials with attention placebo and long-term follow-up. We need to include health outcomes, look at moderators of effect sizes, Dismantle studies if we can, if they're multi-component. Those are very difficult studies to do, but it would be nice to know, um, you know which components were the most effective. And then recruit more ethnically diverse samples, uh, assess treatment fidelity and integrity. Uh, are the families receiving the intervention as it was intended, and are they using it? And then develop technology-based interventions. Clinical implications, re-educate educate people about disease, purpose of adherence, secure patient family agreement, parental involvement is very key, provide incentives, provide self-management skills for adolescents. And I believe that a one-shot bolus of an adherence intervention will not have long-lasting effects. I think interventions are need to, going to need to be incorporated in routine clinical management of pediatric chronic disease or we're not going to succeed. Now, this, I just want to briefly tell you that there's one report in the literature where children were taken away from their parents because of non-adherence, and it happened in the HIV case. And you can read the study, but, but basically the idea was they did everything they could to try to get these families to get their, give their children their, their HIV meds. And two of the six cases, it didn't work, and they really had to take the kid away from the uh, parent. And so there might be instances where that really has to happen. What? Who put that there? That's a book you might want to look at. Thank you. <laughs>